those of you all who know this next song, please feel free to join along. Precious love, take my hand. Good afternoon. It is a pleasure to be before you this afternoon in this wonderful building with these wonderful people. My name is Imani Grace, and I am singing with Mr. Andy Barnett, who is going to um, help me out here a little bit. And this next tune, I hope you would help me out a little bit. And I'm pretty sure most of you all know it, but if you don't, we're gonna we're gonna go over it right now so we can get full participation for those able and willing. This tune is called Wade in the Water, and it's a simple call and response. You can find it in your bulletin if your memory fails you as often as mine does. And the rhythm is real simple. A wade in the water, wade in the water, children, wait in the water. God's gonna trouble the water. That part right there, that's the crucial part. God's gonna trouble the water. Can we get everyone just saying that real quick? A one, two, God's gonna, God's gonna trouble the water. Good. So in the verses, when I point to you, that's your, God's gonna trouble the water, wait in the water, wait in the water, children, wait in the water, God's gonna trouble, good, do that part. 
next one we'll sing it again at the end so know it now like my mother used to say all the time be ready so you don't have to get ready that's what we're going to do right now we're going to learn this tune very easy call and response again and then we'll sing it again later so don't just let it stick let it stick I let your little light shine, shine, shine. I let your little light shine, oh my Lord. Cause there must be someone down in the valley trying to get home. Let your little light shine, shine, shine. Let your little light shine, oh my Lord. Cause there must be someone down in the valley. Trying to get home. Let your little light shine, 
Good afternoon. I'm Mary Ann Buddy, Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Washington. So happy to welcome you here and to join in both conversation and song, um, creating a shared activism among faith traditions and neighbors on the assumption that God has called us all to be a force for good in this world. Uh, to preserve and to protect the dignity of every human being and that a community defined by love and justice for all humankind is what God desires for all of us. That's why we're here. I am honored to be among you and among our esteemed panelists, which we will get to in just a moment, but you all warmed up so beautifully that we're going to continue with our opening song. If you are able to stand, I invite you to stand. You were being a little bit too modest before, so we're expecting you to follow our good leader and belt out this amazing song.
now to place you in the good hands of our moderator, Mr. Robert Rabin, founder and president of the Rabin Group and uh, the co the, one of the prime organizers of the film festival about the March on Washington Film Festival um, for this, which this event is a part. And so, Mr. Rabin, would you please come and take the mantle of this great day? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Bishop Buddy, for having us back uh, at this magnificent uh, cathedral. We are the March on Washington Film Festival, a national platform to, of arts and scholarship and film dedicated to telling our history more honestly. Uh, and we are just delighted to be here and help you facilitate a conversation you've been having uh, about racial justice. We started our uh, festival Thursday night at Israel Baptist Church uh, with a gospel concert in part because it's fun, in part because it's important, in part to remind people that an enormous uh, component or underpinning of the classic civil rights movement was the Christian church in the United States, led heavily by women of the church. Um, uh, and others will talk about the role of men out front, but led heavily by women of the church, and it was a rousing spirit at night, and a couple hours into it, people fell out, as they say in the gospel tradition, and so that's a high uh, goal to achieve this morning, but I'm going to try. We uh, have a gathering this morning of some of the most influential religious and spiritual leaders uh, nationally, particularly on questions of social justice, and we're going to get right to them. Um, to my far left physically, but and, and, and maybe in other ways, <laughs> the amazing uh, Reverend Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas, who in addition to being the canon theologian here, is the current distinguished professor of religion at Goucher, uh, but soon to be the head of a, the Episcopal Divinity School at the Union Theological Seminary, one of the most important institutions um, uh, in the United States. She's an expert in womanist theology and racial reconciliation and sexuality in the black church. And you can get her newest book, Stand Your Ground, Black Bodies and the Justice of God. Uh, sitting next to her is Rabbi Dove Pesner. His formal title is Director of the Religious Action Center on Reform Judaism, Senior VP of the Union for Reform Judaism. His informal title is uh, Agitator for Good. His career is vo devoted to moving the Reform Jewish movement, the largest um, in Judaism, to social engagement and activism across lines of race, faith, and class. Bishop Marion Edgar Buddy is consecrated as the ninth Bishop of Washington uh, since 2011. After serving as 18 years rector of St. John's Episcopal Church in Minneapolis, She's the spiritual leader for nearly 41,000 Episcopalians in 89 congregations and 20 schools uh, in the District of Columbia and four Maryland counties. Dr. Dennis Wiley is the co-pastor with his wife of Covenant Baptist UCC and a board member of the Black Church Center for Social Justice. He serves at the forefront of the struggles for freedom, justice, and equality for all. Google him, uh, it would take a couple hours to list his books, his music, um, his contributions, and his prodigious and incredibly successful family. Dr. Saeed Saeed is the National Director of Interfaith and Community Alliance at the Islamic Society of America, a national umbrella organization with 300 affiliates in the United States and Canada. He's a founder of the Journal of Islamic Social Sciences and editor-in-chief of that publication. He has been president of the Muslim Student Association, and he is a national leader in interfaith understanding. We are, this afternoon, to create a shared religious experience, the rededication, the reclamation of a commitment to racial and social justice change at a minimum conversation, ideally a personal and collective commitment to do something. Last year, 
we were here with a conversation keyed off of Dr. King's letter from a Birmingham jail, which was in fact a response to a letter published by eight white and Jewish leaders in Alabama calling on Dr. King to both slow down and repudiate the reliance on demonstrations and outside agitators, to which Dr. King famously wrote in return in his letter from a Birmingham jail, with respect to um, outside agitators, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And with respect to slowing down, perhaps it is easy for those who have never felt the stinging dart of segregation to say wait. So the first question for our panel, and I'm, I'm going to start with you, Bishop Buddy, this is your house. What are you doing? What is your church doing with respect to racial justice? And I'm going to add, what kind of resistance do you see for people who either won't or don't want to be moved? Let's just start with the easy question. <laughs> Within the, the large community that is the Episcopal Church, there is every impulse and attitude of America represented, as well as the forces that come from immigrant communities coming into the country at various stages of our history and life. And so uh, the, what we're doing is following the, the, the movement of the Holy Spirit that is constantly calling us to the fullest realization of the gospel of Jesus. And re respective to racial justice, that means often people like me following the lead of people like Kelly Brown Douglas or listening to the voices of those who from their firsthand experience and, and, and history call the rest of the church to a greater accountability, much like Dr. King did in his day. And so that movement is alive and well, and the resistance is what you would expect, that there are some, I would say a small percentage, for whom the resistance is fierce and theoretical. And the vast majority, it is, um, it is more resistance by denial and preoccupation with other things. And so part of our task always is to keep the fire burning, keep the issues before ourselves, listen to the voices of those that are easy for the, those of us in the predominant culture to ignore, and, and never give up the conversation. And so whenever there's an opportunity to, to be present, to be engaged, and to create a platform for others to speak from their experience, that's what we're doing. Um, and as I said, the resistance is what you would expect. Um, it's as representative within the church as it is outside the church. And so we aren't just talking to people out there, we're talking to ourselves. And for people like me, that's also acknowledging my own complicit parts and things that I'm not aware of, as well as the way that apathy and preoccupation can distract the likes of me. So, yes. uh, Reverend Dr. Brown, you're, you're also here. You're in other institutions as well. What's your perspective on that? Yes, I would build on what Bishop Buddy is saying. And it also started in another place that one of the things, particularly here at the cathedral, and I think that is something that uh, is also reflective of the wider church in terms of the Episcopal Church and should be a model, is that we have to start with ourselves. And we have to recognize and tell the truth about who we are and who we have been, not simply as uh, individuals, but as an institution, are not simply what had, we like to tell the stories of how, people always tell the stories of how they marched with Martin. And one would think that half the nation marched with uh, Martin Luther King, right? So, and here at the cathedral, we like to tell the story of how Martin Luther King preached his last Sunday sermon in our Canterbury pulpit. And we're proud of that, and we're proud of a lot of other things that we've done. But what we don't often tell the truth about is our complicity in racial injustice. 
And that complicity occurs not only uh, explicitly in the things that we do, but in the things that we don't do. And it also, we are complicit in the stories we won't tell and the truth that we won't tell. And so a part of our role, and one of the things that we've tried to do uh, and began at the cathedral in our renewed commitment uh, to racial justice is to tell the truth of our story. And it seems to me that if we, as a, the National Cathedral and as the Episcopal uh, Communion begins to tell the truth of who we are, then we're really telling the truth about the nation. Because in so many ways, particularly the Episcopal Church is this colonial institution, we reflect uh, the uh, reality of white racism in this country. And so I'll stop there, but the, begin the first step, it seems to me, is the willingness to tell the truth. Rabbi Pesner, you're an influential and important leader dedicated to social action. That is, that is your organization. It's in your organization's title. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a religion, at least in the United States, that's gone from an outsider status uh, to uh, much more insider, obviously not completely. So you, you preside over or you're involved in something that's been on both sides of this equation. What, what's your perspective on, what's number one, what's the work that American Jews are doing? Uh, and what's the resistance? Yeah. First, I just want to echo the words of thanks to you, Robert, and the Raven Group, and to the Cathedral for convening this incredibly important conversation. And this year, it's a broadening to the Jewish community and to the Muslim community to be here with my brother, Dr. Saeed, uh, with whom we've been working together to combat Islamophobia and bigotry in all forms for more than 15 years, is really a blessing. So thank you for broadening the sacred conversation, because we are truly all in this together. Um, we are doing so much and we are not doing nearly enough. So on a strategic level, and then I'll go out to the more kind of spiritual level, we are challenging our reformed Jewish movement, which you describe, Robert, as the largest denomination in Jewish life, to have a movement-wide campaign, which means millions of souls doing reflect, relate, reform. The reflect means having those honest conversations about the truth of ourselves. How are we complicit to study white supremacy, to study white privilege, to be honest in the history of American Judaism, the ways in which we've suffered from anti-Semitism and exclusion, and the ways we have benefited from structures and systems that have led to the kind of radical inequalities where one in three black men will go to jail, but only one in 17 white men will go to jail, and the extent to which we may have benefited from those systems and structures to do movement-wide readings of the new Jim Crow and ta Coates' books, and to, now we have another book to add to the list, by the way, which, I'm, which we're going to do, and Michelle Alexander, and to really do the, what we would call the Heshbon Nefesh, the accounting of our own soul, and to hear the voices, what is different about the Jewish community in America today than from the nostalgia era of the civil rights movement where white Jewish rabbis marched with Dr. King is, 10 to 20 percent of Jews in America are now of color which means it is our own young women and men in our own congregations crying out not only that we reform the systems of oppression and inequality in the country, but that we reform our own synagogues to live out our values. And so then inside of those reflective conversations to be in real right relationship across lines of difference, to be in honest, thoughtful conversations with our Muslim partners, with our Latino Catholic partners, with our African American Christian, and all of the diversity within those institutions. And then in the reform, to build power together to affect change, to be in the face of local law enforcement and local prosecutors and local boards of election and local school boards and local housing authorities, local elected officials, and our national leadership to hold our country accountable to change those systems and repeal and, uh, and transform the rules that actually marginalize folks. So that's, that's the work that we're in. Thank you very much. Dr. Saeed, Dr. Wiley, Pastor Wiley, I'm going to ask you the same question. Of course, you'll, you'll answer whatever you want. Um, I, I know about you religious leaders, but um, you're, you represent denominations and people who have done more pushing for change. Uh, what, what's working? What doesn't work? And that's both f for you know majority population, white and, and non-Islamic, but, but also within your 
communities. Both of you are leaders of, of getting your own flock, your own, your own parishioners to change. What, what works? What doesn't work? Sure. You, go ahead. Go, Dr. Saeed, go ahead. Okay. Uh, go, good afternoon and salam alaikum. Salam. How many of you were uh, alive or how many of you participated in 1963 March on Washington? Raise hands. Great. Now that march, we attribute to that march America's march towards a more inclusive society in terms of race and ethnicity. But I want today to tell you that the organization that I represent and directly and indirectly have been the founder of that Islamic Society of North America started in 1963. So what that means is that we have also, America has taken a march towards not only an inclusive society in terms of race and ethnicity, but in terms of adding a new religion to its landscape. It has been great that in a half a century, how much we have achieved in terms of our own inclusiveness, because Muslims are also diverse. They are all colors, they are all races, they are all ethnicities. This has been the most successful experiment in the history of America, in the history of Islam, and in the history of religious interaction. We are aware of the weaknesses, we are aware of the lapses that we still have uh, uh, at the national level. I have raised children, six children, all of them are married during these 50 years. None of them is married to the same ethnic group. I have 10 grandchildren, they are whitest of the white and blackest of the black. So I believe that as religious leaders, we have to provide models beyond ethnicity beyond race and create that model that our prophet, that Jesus, that the prophets throughout history have tried to reach out beyond their tribes, beyond their geographical divisions and create a man and a woman who really are global and are committed to love thy neighbor, whatever that neighbor, whatever color and whatever faith that neighbor may represent. So that's where we are. And we have, in these 50 years, had ups and downs, different kinds of ways where we got truly, I mean, pushed in this right direction. And many of you may remember that in 2010, when that crazy pastor in Florida threatened to burn the Quran, and we were scared. We thought that perhaps America is rolling back its commitment to respect for religions. So we were worried. Even though burning of the Quran would not have been a problem, even if he had burned 100,000 or million Qurans, there are hundreds of thousands of Muslims who memorize the Quran. But that was the time, you recollect, it was August 2010, and there was this Ground Zero mosque had to be built in New York and a couple of Islamic centers in the Midwest. There was so much of opposition and that was the time when Reform Judaism, conservative Jews, various denominations of Christians, National Council of Churches, Catholic Conference of Bishops, Presbyterians, Methodists, and all of them, they said, we cannot tolerate this. This is not Christianity. This is not Judaism. 
attack on one religion is attack on all religions. So they came to Washington, D.C. They organized a major press conference where they reiterated this thing. They said, we stand with American Muslims against anti-Muslim bigotry. They created an organization, a powerful campaign called Shoulder to Shoulder with American Muslims against anti-Muslim sentiment. They raised about quarter million dollars. They created the position of a director. And this has been amazing, this shoulder to shoulder, the work it has done during the last six, seven years. is amazing how America stood up and opposed this kind of extremism, this kind of bigotry, and targeting one particular ethnicity, one particular religious community. So there is so much of rich experience what we have gained because we have not only been targeted as people of different colors and ethnicities, but because of our distinct religion, which we believe is a continuation of Christianity and Judaism. But we were on the receiving end in many ways. Thank you very much for that. Pastor Wiley? Yes, when I think about that question in terms of what are we doing at our church, we're approaching it in several, in several ways. Uh, first of all, we realize that racism in and of itself has internal um, consequences within the African American community in terms of our sense of who we are and being proud of ourselves and our heritage. And so one of the things that we've done just to deal with the whole concept of self-hate, which is a, a part of the whole uh, uh, issue of racism, is that when you enter our church, uh, there are, and I think about that when I come to the cathedral, uh, we have stained glass windows as well. Um, but our stained glass windows are all um, pertaining to uh, the history and culture of black people in this nation and in this world. Um, some of the themes that we have are liberation and we have um, portraits in, in the stained glass windows of Martin Luther King Jr., Ralph Abernathy, Harriet Tubman, um, Mary McLeod Bethune, Rosa Parks, etc. That's just in one window, liberation. And then we have other windows that deal with uh, heritage and generations and service and um, many other themes that are represented in those windows. Those windows preach in and of themselves and not only do black people um, who enter our church, not only are they blessed by those windows, but they're also, uh, they're whites and they're Latinos and Asians and others who come in also and the windows preach in and of themselves. So we cannot just assume that because we are black, we have a healthy sense of our heritage and our culture. Another thing that we do is that we have um, programs that are built into our ministry. We have the Christ African Theological Institute. And that's a word that I coined, is putting Christ and Africa together in, in a positive way. Um, and trying to change the narrative as it pertains to the relationship between Christianity and black people and especially our brothers and sisters in Africa. And so this is an institute in which we look at social issues and we decide which ones we want to address and how we want to attack those issues. We also have a social justice ministry that does the same thing. Another thing I'd like to point out is that we must keep in mind the, what King said, we must take to heart what he said, that none of us is free until all of us are free. And he was able to connect the dots of racism and other forms of oppression that take place around the world. And so I'll often say, having grown up in the segregated South in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, going to segregated uh, restaurants and movie theaters and bathrooms and water fountains and schools, etc. 
I always say that those of us who have been the victims of oppression ought to be the last ones to oppress anybody else. And when I say that, what I'm saying is that if we don't realize and take seriously our interconnectedness with our brothers and sisters who are oppressed in other ways, whether we're talking about uh, class, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, ethnicity, ability, age, national origin, religion, whatever, then we are all missing an opportunity to join together and to make sure that we are struggling together. And I think that that's significant. And it was brought, sharpened for me when we invited Black Lives Matter to come into our church. A lot of them won't go into black churches, especially because black folk are so homophobic and heterosexist. And so we invited them in and they were delighted and pleasantly surprised that we as a church in the poorest ward in Washington, D.C., Ward 8, would open our doors, our arms, and our hearts so that we can work together. And some folks probably think that Black Lives Matter only involves black folk. It does not. I was very pleasantly surprised when I went down that when they had one of their first mass meetings at Covenant. And I saw so many white people there who were sincere, interested in this issue of racism, how it has reared its ugly head once more as it continues to do after we make any kind of gains, most recently having a black president, then we find ourselves fighting against this kind of backlash. And so again, um, King said another of his quotes, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So I don't think we can be in silos and say, well, I'm just going to deal with racism. I'm just going to deal with uh, sexism. I'm just going to deal with reproductive justice. We deal with it all because it's all a matter of social justice. And as we help our brothers and sisters who are dealing with other forms of oppression, we also help ourselves. You've been practicing intersectionality decades before the kids gave you the term. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Reverend Douglas, did you want to get in here? No, just for, uh, perhaps as I listen to all to, uh, to affirm that and to say, uh, in particular, I think building up on in some respects what Dr. Wiley and Dr. Said said that it is important to understand that when we talk about racism in particular, as we're discussing here, that we're talking about racism as it is institutionalized and uh, structurally and systematically. But we're also talking about the way it perpetuates itself in our interactions with each other and interpersonally. And as faith communities, we have to attack both. And so that means, yes, doing the work. We have to be vigilant in terms of the prophetic work, in terms of social justice and advocating for social justice and uh, advocating against uh, those forms of injustice and speaking up. And we have to take the lead. And that's what we have to do as religious communities because we claim that we believe in, whether we call it the beloved community, the kingdom of God, whatever we call it, we claim to believe in a different vision. And so we need to lead the way toward that vision. But then we can't lose sight of the fact that much of this is upheld because of the way we interact or don't interact with one another. That not only do structures and systems perpetuate themselves, but there is a particular consciousness that also perpetuates itself. A particular narrative, I'll speak in this instance of sort of an anti-black narrative, but there's a racist narrative that perpetuates itself. And one of the ways in which it does that is because we don't do something proactively to interrupt that narrative. For instance, recent studies have emerged that suggest that in our children's literature, that 73% of the characters in that literature are white. Less than 1% of the characters of that uh, in, in our literature of people of First Nation, uh, that less than 8% are African American, less than 7% are Latinx persons, and so forth. How do we ever begin 
to interrupt the narrative of stereotypes and other things that people have in relationship to each other if we don't become more proactive, for instance, in, in the way in which we introduce uh, diversity to even our children. This matter of stained glass windows and the icons, religious icons that we have in our churches, it ought not simply be African-American churches that have images of black Christ and that have images of, of people of color in their stained glass windows. It's important there, but it's also important in other churches, in, in, in other communities that are not African American. Why? Because we claim that everybody that is created that has breath is a reflection of God. That how can we appreciate the sacredness of everybody if indeed we don't reflect the sacredness of everybody in our institutions and that means in our sacred icons and our sacred imagery etc cetera, etc cetera. so I just want to affirm that we have to be aware in the churches and religious communities can do this in the conversations we have in the literature we have in the images that we present we have to interrupt the narrative that allows for the perpetuation of society and structural racism, and nobody notices it. Let me ask you a, a theological question. <laughs> or it's, I can't ask a theological question. I'm going to ask a question I'd like a theological answer. Uh, and then I'm going to sit down. We're going to do this lightning round because we're going to open it up to the congregation. Can a church itself, and I'm not trying to mess with your C3 status, but can a church <laughs> itself sin? And if so, what does repentance look like for a church? Now that's, that's lightning round. Oh, well, oh my goodness. Can a church itself sin? To, yes, indeed. Here's the thing. The church has to consistently ask itself, and this is what we have to ask ourselves as religious communities, but as a church, we have to ask ourselves, are we simply a social institution that happens to be religious, or are we a church? And more often than not, we find ourselves being a social institution that happens to be religious and not a church. And when we aren't a church, we're sinning. And that means we are betraying what it means to lead the people, to lead the nation toward what we want to call the beloved community, a place where all people, I always, this, this, this scripture talks about a time where the first are last and the last are first. That is not a time where there's a reversal of fortunes. So suddenly the oppressed become the powerful and the powerful become the oppressed. No, it's a time when the last are first and the first are last because you can't tell the difference. There are no last and there are no first. We're all equal. In as much as the church doesn't lead us that way, we've sinned and it's betrayed what it's meant to be church. I have, a, I have a one word answer to the question, which is amen to what she said. <laughs> uh, I'll just add one sentence of commentary. Uh, Jewish people, if there are Jewish people in the room, you know what I'm talking about. We think about sin a little bit differently than our Christian sisters and brothers. We understand the notion in Hebrew of al chait which is the Jewish word that is often translated as sin, but really doesn't mean sin. It means if you are a marksman and you are aiming for a target, you have missed the mark. But what's beautiful about the theology of that is it assumes you are trying to make the mark. So we are perpetually struggling to be right and be in right relationship with God and our other human beings, but we, of course, miss the mark more than we get it right. So can we be in the state of hate? Yes, constantly. We have to get ourselves back to that place of right relationship. And what does that look like? It means that on a very granular level, when a 13-year-old boy who is of color comes off the bima from his bar mitzvah and is handed the tray and told by the caterer to go start serving because of the assumption that the black kid in the room must be on the wait staff, we have committed a, a hate and we have to get it right. Or if we are not in right relationship with the church two blocks down that is struggling with some of the systemic oppression and we aren't proximate and in relationship, again, al hate shechatanu lefanecha, we have missed the mark. There is no lightning round with spiritual leaders. <laughs> Probably the most devastating experience that you can have as a religious leader or a religious institution is to realize how long you've gone not seeing something. 
um, not realizing something that was profoundly true and deeply painful, and you were a part of it. And that that process happens regularly. And in relationship to racial justice with just excruciating shame. And so to come to terms with that uh, usually requires the kind of preparation that has brought people into relationship with one another, the way you were describing, Dr. Douglas, and that sense of we are in conversation, so that has opened my eyes, and that has meant that you have a platform of authority in the community to help shape a new future, and that that is part of the repentance process, so that the next generation can speak about that as a time of turning and change, and we can mark it in a different path that we have taken collectively. When we talk about the church um, sinning, we need to think back again to Martin Luther King's uh, letter to the Birmingham, letter from the Birmingham jail. And I guess one of the questions would be, when we use the word church, who are we talking about? Which church are we talking about or, or which group of churches? Certainly the church was sinning in that particular instance when they were encouraging King to calm it down and be more gradual, etc. When the scriptures clearly say that, you know, we need to stand up for justice and for righteousness, etc. So that's an example of the church sinning. Uh, but then that's the white church sinning. The, the black church sins as well uh, in terms of just trying to ride off of the gains of the civil rights struggle and believing that somehow because a black president was elected that now we're in some kind of post-racial uh, society. And so we uh, have to realize that we have to do the, the work that we need to do. Another way, again, getting back to my earlier point, and everybody's challenged by this. Um, let me just say it while I'm thinking of it. The cathedral here uh, has a relationship with our church, and that is helping us to also uh, learn how to work across racial lines um, cooperatively. And uh, so I'm, I'm very appreciative of the relationship that we have, um, and we're hoping for that, getting back to what Dr. Douglas has said, that it needs to be a real relationship. It needs not to be just something that's on the surface because um, that helps us to penetrate beneath the outer shell of racist, racism and co go to the, the heart of it. It really bothers me when, whenever, so often, whenever black folk bring up racism, we're accused of playing the race card. Um, race is not a card game. Uh, it is a situation in which people are suffering and dying every day. So when you come into our church, another thing that we do, and again, getting back to these icons and symbols, um, our vision statement, and some, even some black people in our church had a difficulty with it when, when it was first introduced. But it begins by saying, affirming our African heritage. And the way we understand it, that is not an exclusive statement because Africa is the cradle of humankind. It's where we all came from. And so it tests one's racism, especially if one is not black, uh, if they have a problem with that. Because you can open up any kind of book, history book or uh, whatever, and you will, it clearly, there's no debate about that question. So we all have an African heritage, whether we want to admit it or not. Um, and so I think that kind of thing is important. But we go on to say, affirming our African heritage, our vision is to build an inclusive body, inclusive, everybody, body of biblical believers who continue to grow in Christ as we love, serve, and fellowship with each other. Uh, the last thing I'll say on that point is that um, we are affiliated with organizations like the Black Church Center, um, uh, the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference, et cetera. Um, and we work diligently. I mean, we are on the front lines. It's hard to get folk to protest these days, but we keep working at it. Whether we're talking about genocide in Darfur or minimum wage for workers, or if we're talking about uh, reproductive justice for black women as well as all women, 
or if we're talking about uh, voting rights for the District of Columbia, and my wife and I have gone to jail uh, in the interest of that. Um, and what we're seeing going around today is a serious effort to, to turn back the hands of time so that the people who fought and died, including Martin Luther King, and I don't know how many of you may have seen John Lewis on CNN the other night, but those who have gone through struggle, have suffered, have shed blood, so that we might get to a point, so we cannot sit around quietly and allow folks to come in now and say, um, you know, we're going to turn up the heat on voter suppression. And we're going to act like a whole bunch of folk voted who weren't supposed to vote uh, this last election, et cetera. So I think that we have to be vigilant. We have to stay on the case. And I know I'm not doing lightning, so I'll shut up at this time. Thank you. You know, in Islam, we have five pillars of Islam. First is belief in one God, belief in all the prophets from Judaism, Christianity, and so on. Then the second thing is that we have to fast whole month of Ramadan. And then the third pillar is to give annually two and a half percent of our savings as charity. Then we have going to Hajj to have global pilgrimage. These are very uh, strenuous, rigorous, uh, acts of worship so that one can develop that personality of a faithful. But our prophet says after having for uh, 23 years he was, he, his this mission as a prophet, raising a community in Medina, helping people to develop this kind of way of life. But at one time, after having told them how critical these things are, so at one time he told them I have to tell you something with praying five times a day, fasting for whole month of Ramadan, giving charity. I have to tell you today that what trumps all these acts of, uh, acts of uh, religion is to avoid any shade of discrimination or racism. Did you get that? That means the racism nullifies what actually defines a religious person. Religiosity, the faith, is wiped out by a shade of discrimination, which may be based on color, which may be based on ethnicity, which may be based in any other way that the devil, the Satan, would like to promote. So here I have to tell you something. We are faced with Islamophobia. Every day you hear very difficult and dangerous things happening. Masjids being, mosques being burned, people being targeted and so on. So naturally we know Christianity could never encourage such a thing. Judaism would never condone such a thing. But we are shocked to hear Duke University has a project, a study of Islamophobia. These are scholars, objective, trained anthropologists who work and research to find out where does this Islamophobia come from. They have traced in their project, they have published this book. You should read that book. The name of the book is Terrified. And the writer is Professor Christopher Bale. He has found that in four years, $240 million were channeled into this machine that is promoting it. What that means is Christianity teaches people, love thy neighbor. But these people are using these million dollars to teach Christians to hate thy neighbor. Did you get this message? 
So there are agencies, there are group interest groups, there are myopic religious people who are using money to teach people to hate their neighbor. So that's why it is our responsibility as people of faith to find out where the darkness is and where we can search light. The role of religion is to bring light. The role of Antichrist is to bring darkness. We are the people of light and we want to stand for light. We want to chase away and fight against darkness. That's why the experience that I told you about shoulder to shoulder where Christians and Jews stand, stood up against Islamophobia formally, providing support for it, providing the, the resources for it. It gave us a wonderful model to go to the Muslim world, go to the Arab world, go to Pakistan and Afghanistan and tell them that when we hear a, a church has been blown up along with its congregation and go to Iraq and tell them when a bus carrying Christians is being bombed, this is not what where our name, Islam, should be mentioned, where Allahu Akbar, Allah is the greatest, should be mentioned. So we have provided the model that we created in America, shoulder to shoulder. And you will be amazed that this organization which came up, this is a unique American contribution for creating religious brotherhood, religious tolerance. Europe needs it most. That's why it was a good news for us. When Finnish, when, when in Finland, they started first time shoulder to shoulder with Finnish Muslims. The rest of the Scandinavian countries are following. This is the antidote to Islamophobia and racism for France, for Germany, for all the countries in Europe and in the Muslim world. Thank you. Now it's your all's turn. My name's Michelle Dibley. I'm the program director here at the cathedral. Pleased that you all are here. We've had an opportunity to listen to our panelists share some of their thoughts. And these conversations are not complete when we sit and listen, if we're only listening to the people in front of us and not to the people near us, around whom we sit. So at this moment, we want to invite you to take eight to 10 minutes or so to talk to a couple of folks near you. Maybe they're not people that you came with. Maybe you get to meet someone new. And if you want a couple of conversation starters, here they are. What brought you here today, right? Why are you here on a Sunday afternoon? And what, from what has had happened already today, resonates with you, is provoking for you? And then finally, do you have a question in common that you would like to ask one or more of our panelists? We'll take a few questions when we come back from your time to talk to one another. And I'm gonna turn it over to y'all to take a few minutes to do that.
All right. I am so happy to hear such conversation echoing around the nave here. It is delightful to hear you all connecting with one another. I hope that was a rich time, although it was brief. We are going to turn now to an opportunity for you all to engage more with our guests up front here. We're gonna do that by just taking open questions. So Broderick from the March on Washington Film Festival will have one microphone. I will have a second. So we're gonna start on this side of the room and then I'll jump on this side. So please keep a couple of things in mind. One is that the briefer your question and the briefer our responses, the more opportunity we'll have to get more content on the table. And then the second thing is that we are going, Broderick and I will do our best to take questions from, based on what we can see of you, a range of kinds of folks based on whether that's age or gender or race, just so we can get as many voices in this room as possible before we conclude with a final song and some words from Pastor Coates. So if you've got a question, raise your hand and Broderick's gonna come your way. Hello, my question is, um, I've been thinking a lot about the importance of proximity. If we want to get to know each other, we need to be with each other. We need to be doing things together, um, literally shoulder to shoulder. Otherwise, our understanding of each other's lives is really theoretical. So in a society as segregated as ours, what do you think we can do to encourage proximity? Um, so that we can really get to know each other. There's no, um, there's no shortcut for intentionality in the culture in which we live. It is a daily commitment to seek out relationships with those who are not in whatever zone we find ourselves in. And I find that to be... Um, there are places where it's easier than others and communities that facilitate that more than others, but in my life, it is a daily practice. And I, I think as communities, we need to never keep our eye off of that ball. Can I have one, one the quick theological thing there? So, and I'll make it quick. Um, you know, everybody knows the famous phrase from Torah, reacha kamocha, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's the easy one. 36 different ways it says you shall love the stranger. 36 different ways because it is 36 times harder to get to know and not just tolerate, not just accept, but to love the person who is different than you. We need to start loving more and being proximate. And I was just going to mention that um, I, I thank you for that question because it's, it's extremely important. Um, and I learned from Howard Thurman, who some of you may not know, was a great African-American preacher and author, mystic, uh, theologian, etc. And he talked about contact without fellowship. Contact without fellowship. Um, and he also, when he grew up in, in the South and was attending uh, high school, he talked about missionaries from the north sending down the missionary barrel that was full of clothes and other kinds of things that uh, poor people needed. But he said he resented the fact that they didn't get to know him. And so he felt in a way as if he was a missionary object. And there's a quote that I remember that he said that I always wish that I could minister to the human need or the need of another human being without putting my contaminated fingers into the quiet recesses of their private dignity. And so what he basically is saying is that we have to be intentional about this. It's not just going to happen. And again, that's why I appreciate the relationship with the cathedral. Uh, I think we can, we can do this but we have to be intentional so that we're not just passing each other in the night, but we're really beginning to learn each other's stories, each other's background, each other's histories, so that we can truly work genuinely together. 
Audio. Sure. Well, go ahead. Hold on one sec. You know that the spaces, common spaces, may be limited space as you're talking. But God has his own plans. We are living in an age of globalization. Space has been taken over by a different nature of space. That is internet. That is Google. I am proud to say that here in this country, we have multiple organizations, multiple different groups working for the right causes. And earlier we wouldn't have perhaps located all of them who is where. You just go to Google and decide what you are looking for. And we are really proud of it. And this gives us confidence that being in this country with so much of tradition of openness and with all the problems, you can discover the right people at the right time and join them and advance this, uh, this thinking. And the possibility that Google will sponsor this in the future. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, good afternoon. Amazing. Good afternoon. So there's a growing shift among many African Americans towards uh, a sort of economic activism. Uh, and so, uh, and that's even going beyond boycotting, but actually uh, seeking to build institutions to combat racism and discrimination. So my question towards you all would be, what role, if any, do you believe that you all's religious institutions play in the economic development or that economic activism to combat racism and discrimination? I think we should uh, play a key role in that. Uh, again, um, I mentioned earlier, and I see uh, Dr. Delman Coates here, who's the uh, president of the Black Church uh, Center. Um, and he has uh, hosted several um, conference calls throughout the nation to deal with some of these issues. Um, I don't know that I would have the expertise myself alone to design what's needs to, what needs to be done. Um, to address, I think you're right on point, because that economic disparity that we face between blacks and whites and others uh, is, is tremendous. And I read somewhere where it, it really hasn't gotten any better uh, when you look at it from the large picture than it was during the Civil Rights Movement in terms of the economic progress of black people in this nation. And when we look at uh, intergenerational wealth, yeah. et cetera, and then we look at mass incarceration, when we look at unemployment, uh, et cetera, then it all adds up. And uh, again, I was just talking with Bishop Bud in our community, Ward 8 in Washington, D.C. It's difficult to find. We might have maybe a couple of grocery stores that are first-class grocery stores, but basically there's so many food deserts. And so all of this gets back to, again, what Dr. Uh, Douglas was talking about in terms of institutional racism. Personal racism is one thing, but institutional, and, and many people would define that the definition of racism is that it's systemic and institutional. It's different from personal prejudice or bias but it is an institutionalized system designed to keep the status quo as it is. And so you're right, we, I would love to see, and we would readily become a part of a movement where we could um, collectively uh, use our financial leverage to make a difference. Can I sp speak to that I, as well? I echo uh, the need for that, I think, First of all, Dr. Wally's right. One of the things that we've seen is an increase in the wealth gap. We have to help people to become more aware. Uh, there's a privilege of ignorance. And so, and, and of course, typically that privileges people who don't suffer. 
uh, from the economic disparity. We have to help people become aware of the way that is institutionalized, the racialized nature of the economic disparities that we see in our country, the way in which that has been institutionalized. And I commend, and I've commended to people on this panel, I commend the book, and some of you may have read it already, a recent book by Richard Rothstein called The Color of Law. And that book very much details how the government segregated America and how that is intertwined with economics in this country. So one, we have to become aware of the way in which that functions. And people are not aware of the way in which that functions so that we can call it out and act against it. The other thing, and I'll briefly say, is that the church, one of the, uh, when the black church community has been at its best historically, it has filled that gap. And it has served, as some have said, as a nation within a nation uh, in some respects to fill the gap that has been left because of the neglect, the sort of economic neglect. Churches, again, whether they're African American or not, the religious community has to become aware of the gaps and they have to be proactive in filling the gaps. At the same time that we protest against the systems and structures, we always have to be aware that in the moments of protest, there are people who are suffering. And so our faith communities have to fill the gap economically and otherwise. And that just doesn't mean money. That means all the ramifications of what that means to create conditions of poverty, uh, which are conditions of death. So we have to speak into this narrative of poverty, which very much is racialized. Okay. Yeah. I just want to say, and we must not forget that Martin Luther King was assassinated in the midst of organizing the Poor People's That's Campaign. Right. Down, the, uh, down the street and across a very small theological divide is Georgetown University, which we all know in this community, uh, you know, it's been admitted, and it's true for many universities, Georgetown has just had to admit it, that the endowment was buttressed by the sale of slaves. Uh, you know, fast forward, where is that endowment invested now? That's right. That's right. Are there people of color and women managing the money and getting those right. fees? Are they at the table making decisions about the real estate investments, um, about um, which funds will be invested in? We've been successful in this country with ant moving pension funds and endowments and, and corporate treasuries uh, in the anti-apartheid movement. Now with the Sudan, we're doing it with environmental issues. There's been virtually no organizing around the domestic question of people of color and women and whether or not these trillions of dollars of assets ought to be looked at as an impact investment vehicle for improving some of our own infrastructure in this community. So, so often the church has been characterized as the oppressor, and that's clearly not the theme that I've been hearing on the panel today. You've talked about inclusion with not just um, race, but religion and gender equality, orientation, all those things. So what are you guys doing from a national standpoint and with your, your voices, your congregations, to be a louder voice for the church, which I would say is the truer voice of of how we really should engage with um, each other. Well, um, it's very difficult. Um, <clears throat> one of the things uh, my wife and I have written several, um, had published several um, articles and pieces uh, in, in books, etc., that lift up what we're trying to do. Um, but There is, again, I go back to what I said earlier. Um, those in the black church, people who have the kind of progressive theology that we have are few and far between, unfortunately. And so it is a real struggle. I mean, uh, a lot of people are aware of what we're doing. And, um, but in terms, I, I guess, one answer would be probably that we need to do a better job of using the um, social media, et cetera, 
to be able to get that message out there because a lot of people are very surprised when they hear you mean there's a church like that a black church like that you know and so um, it's, it's a good point and I think we're, we're working on that uh, to try to make sure that we do a more effective job because the religious right has hijacked what it means to be a Christian and it, as we're seeing today it has so much to do with regressive kind of things turning back the hands of time um, repealing and replacing you know uh, Obamacare or what have you and all of this kind of stuff and and it's just uh, it's just a shame and a lot of that is defended by so-called religious right people who are really religious wrong if you ask me um, <laughs> So full disclosure, I, I grew up in that environment, right? So I know it pretty well from a, um, from a visceral, uh, emotional standpoint. And what I can tell you about that monolithic, what seems to be a monolithic group called, that we might call the religious right, is that it's way more diverse and way more complicated than you might realize. And um, we're not going to outshout them, right? So part of the... Part of my strategy is actually to uh, pay attention to the fault lines and the conversations that are happening within what, um, what used to be my people and to align myself with those who are actually have greater credibility speaking truth to their communities than I will ever have because I have been discredited by where I sit now and the positions I've taken publicly. So there's a lot of room for hope. I don't think we can discount the vast majority of white America. I think we actually have to, and the homophobic black America, I think we have to actually work in tandem with people who can be moved. Um, at the same time, um, when need be, being a voice of resistance and clarity and protest. But I think if we just did one, um, I, I think there's more than one way to build the kingdom of God, I should say it that way, and that there's more than one approach we can take depending on whom we're talking with. And I find it fascinating, absolutely fascinating, that there's a whole new wave of religious expression in this country that is decidedly non-political that there's this imagining that we can be Christian and not be political. And part of it is an exhaustion with a kind of politics that they don't want any affiliation with, but not a readiness to engage some of the issues that we've been talking about today. And it's a step in the right direction. It's not, there's a lot to be done there, but at least we can have a conversation. And I'm finding that to be fertile ground. And so, um, and it, but it also makes for some very uncomfortable conversations and disappointing and actually angering some of my closest allies um, whenever I step into that terrain. Does that make sense? I mean, you're nodding and I appreciate that, but it's a, it's a, it's a tender place. Um, but I feel like there's got to be some room there. Otherwise, um, I don't see where the pivot points are going to come in this country. Can I say one quick thing to that? Yes. Can I have the mic? For, thank you. So we're going to run out of time before you all ask your questions. So uh, Dr. Douglas is going to say a sentence, and then we've got we're going to put three more questions on the table in a row, and y'all can choose which ones you want to answer because there are times when the questions are as important as the answers. So we want to make sure to surface as many of those as we can. We have a hard stop at 2.45. Our panelists have to be walking off the platform. We can't change that time. What we do want to do is make sure we wrap up with some songs and some final words. So we're going to keep this moving, but thank you for your graciousness as we get as many of your voices into the conversation as we can. Dr. Douglas. Since I just wanted to say the direct response to you. How do we sort of change the narrative and I just think that things like this do and especially when the platform is something like the National Cathedral we have to do more things like this and be more bold I just have a question of curiosity as to why with this, the long history that the Roman Catholic Church has in social justice issues 
why they were not a participant today in these discussions, particularly with Georgetown University being brought up as well and has a lot to contribute in this discussion. And my question deals with the uh, geopolitical aspect of all this. I mean, you have so many communities that are insulated, meaning that they don't have persons of color living in them. And then you get to this uh, whole issue of supremacy, racial supremacy. And how do we deal with that as a church? And I'm a Christian, but uh, any religion has a stake in this, or all religions have a stake in this. So the geopolitical piece and also dealing with this whole idea of racial supremacy and how do we get people to realize that we're all equal in God's eyes. I hear the church um, speaking of itself as being complicit a lot. And um, I hear you speaking from up there in ways in which the church is culpable, but I don't hear that word spoken much. And I'm wondering if we moved the continuum from complicity to culpability, how that may, might look in the church. Speak out. <laughs> Where, where are the Catholics? Where are the Catholics? What's the role of sin and culpability? I think you could, Michelle, you could ask where are the Catholics, uh, those of who helped plan. No, no intention, no intention. It's an excellent point, and we will do this again, and we will permutate. There are many, many denominations, but that's an obvious omission. And I think complicity and culpability go together. And, uh, and so as we talk about complicity, we uh, name the ways in which we're complicit. And when we talk about culpability, that's sort of guilt. We have to sort of move beyond that and move toward, uh, if we want to keep it in theological terms, move it toward repentance, which is turning around, naming our sin, and doing something different. And collusion is culpability. Collusion. <laughs> keep that word in there, too. <laughs> There's a request for you to expand on that by a sentence or two, Dr. Wiley. I think most people got the message. <laughs> um, you know, in today's news, uh, you know, the word collusion is being thrown all, around a lot. Uh, but I'm just saying that, um, and com complicity is close to that word, um, but so they are, they go together, it seems to me, when it comes to issues like this. Um, when, uh, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. I feel we have to address the issue of the geopolitical reality and the, um, the persistence of that segregation in churches and it reflected even more now in the society. And, um, I see it, at, I personally see it on two levels. One is that just that constant cultivation of relationship that would allow for the kind of conversations that would make the reality of white supremacy um, more apparent and also more unacceptable because we've become friends and we've become co-partners in our communities and our neighborhoods. And then, which is much harder in, I think, the geopolitical realities we face right now because so much of it is nameless, that we have to, we have to be more vigilant or wise as serpents, the way Jesus said about what's, what decisions are being made on our behalf that we're not even aware of until the fruits of it are well down the road. And and I'm as um, frustrated and humbled by that as anyone and, and always keeping my sights on the, on the ways we can collectively address that. I would, I would build on that by uh, amplifying the great words of a wonderful rabbi who said, some are guilty, but all are responsible. Some are guilty, but all are responsible. So let's go forth together in our shared responsibility.
that sounds like a great note to move on. Thank you all for your questions. Thank you for juggling your responses and sharing the floor. Um, clearly, there is much more to do together and outside of this room. So my job in this moment is to say a couple of words about next steps, and then uh, we'll have our final words and our song. So in terms of next steps, those of us who convened this gathering today have a commitment to reconvene in the fall here at the cathedral for another multi-faith gathering addressing racial and social justice. The difference will be that rather than sitting in rows, y'all will be sitting in circles, so clusters of six or seven people, so we can talk with each other, right? So if you would like to be engaged in that gathering and future work from this conversation, you will notice that you have a three by five card. I think there are additional cards floating around, so if you don't have one, there are a couple of runners who can help you find a blank card. Here's what we'd like you to do. We've if you did not register ahead of time, that means we probably don't have your email. So if you write your name and your email on the card, legibly, so that we can type it into the computer and it gets to you, and then give us two, we have two questions for you. One is, is there a piece of feedback, positive or critical, that you'd like to offer those of us who planned this so that we can take that into account as we move forward? And then the second one is, is there an idea you have of something you'd like us to begin to do together as a community? If you have an idea, put it down. That'll be the beginning of the ways in which we hope to continue to gather and work together as we come to know one another and build relationships. So those are the next steps. Come back in the fall, we'll let you know when it is, and tell us who you are and a couple of, a couple of other pieces of information. And uh, we are very eager to uh, continue this conversation with those, of f those folks who are here sitting in front and also those of you who are sharing this experience from the nave. I am going to uh, hand it over to uh, Pastor Delman Coates from Mount Enon Church, who will share some final words with us just prior to uh, Mani and Andy leading us in a final song. So just before the close, I'll say thank you once again on the behalf of the cathedral, to our panelists, to those of you who are coming here and who we will hopefully see in the future. Good afternoon. Let's give it up for our panelists once again. Many, many thanks to all of you for challenging us today in some very provocative ways. We have been challenged to address both uh, racism and uh, at the uh, systemic level and have been challenged to address pre prejudice uh, at the individual personal level. And I really just want to say that when I, as I stand here today, I am reminded of how saddened I was to hear about the 17-year-old girl, Nabra Hassanin, from the Adams community in Sterling, Virginia, just a few weeks ago. A few days before that, I invited deacons from our church and ministers from our church to go to Friday prayer at the All Dulles Area Muslim Society service that Friday to worship there and to break bread with Imam Majid. I think the challenge before us today is to not merely convert heads, but also to convert hearts. And I think that comes by relationships. We have to forge and form relationships across racial and interfaith lines. And I believe that will provide the context for us to rally together and to mobilize together when we see injustice taking place against Dr. Saeed, Rabbi Pessner's community, or any community. I am thankful since the last time we met here a year ago, I have had a, an incredible opportunity to break bread with Rabbi Pessner, to have Bishop Buddy at our congregation to briefly address our congregation, and I look forward to ongoing dialogue uh, and partnership with her and to fellowship with Muslims in our community who need us to stand up for them. 
because we are all in this together. Thank you so much to the Washington Film Festival, the Black Church Center for Justice and Equality, the Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism, the Islamic Society of Northern America, the Episcopal Church, and the Washington National Cathedral. Thank you so much for being with us today. A blessing from all of you. Thank you very much. Um, and a few of you, Dr. Saeed mentioned the light. The light that we are called to reflect of the great and mighty God that we serve. So we're going to sing this song one more time before um, I bless you in peace to dismiss. Let your little light shine, shine, shine. Let your little light shine, oh my Lord. Cause there must be someone down in the valley trying to get home. Let your little light shine, shine, shine. Let your little light shine, oh my Lord. Cause there must be someone down in the valley Trying to get home Let your little light shine, shine, shine Let your little light shine, oh my Lord Cause there must be someone down in the valley Trying to get home Let your Shine, shine, shine. Let your little light shine, oh my Lord. Cause there must be someone down in the valley trying to get home. One more time, let your little light shine. Ooh, let your little light shine, oh my Lord. Cause there must be someone down in the valley trying to get home praise the lord i bless you in the matchless name of all that is right and all that is good oh god we thank you i bless you may you go in peace and love to serve the lord amen mm -hmm.